it, it's a remarkable fact, really, that the world has not always been the way it is today, not just in you know, human terms, which as a paleobiologist sort of sees the, the trivial topsoil on top of the rest of life's wonders, um, but also in the environments around us. But from the human perspective, these changes are often really hard to notice, right? We sort of fix as normal, even in historical terms, the, the environments of our youth, and historically, there's been very little reason, really, to suggest that things have not always been so. Now, I grew up in the in the in, in Rannoch in the Highlands, and um, of course, there the the, the native uh, ecosystem is this temperate rainforest, of which the black wood of Rannoch is um, one of the very few surviving fragments that has not been replaced by either so sort of repeatedly burnt heather to support shooting populations of grouse, or um, or uh, pine. Uh, monocultures for timber. Um, but of course, that even that landscape, that temperate rainforest is a relatively young phenomenon. Only about 12,000 years ago, Rannoch was buried under um, ice sheets that were kilometers deep, right? These are environments which are as much a product of the time in which they happen to exist as the land on which they grow. Now, the first person to recognize that um, climates could change, that environments were not um, always constant, lived longer ago than you might expect. You have to go back um, almost a thousand years to a man called Shen Kuo, who um, was a civil servant administrator, polymath in the Song Dynasty of China. He was a very smart man. Um, he was part of the reformist group of politicians at the time. He was an engineer. He invented the magnetic compass um, and was the first person to recognize that true north and magnetic north were different from one another and how to change that. Um, he also had his role as an administrator and a surveyor. And in 1080, um, he was surveying the results of a landslip in Yanshou in, in, in northern China um, when he noticed um, uh, exposed by this landslip was this unmistakable open space underground where there was bamboo um, petrified seemingly and, and you know turned to stone and this puzzled him right because in Yanshou, Yanshou is quite far north it's generally too cool and too arid for bamboo to grow and in all the historical records he looked at he could find no evidence that bamboo had ever grown there and so he proposed um, that the climates must have changed and that at some point in the past, he didn't know whether it was a, a historical time uh, which was absent from the records or sometime prehistoric, which he did speculate on, um, that, that the climate of the landscape had been more suited to bamboo. Climates change. Now, in the intervening thousand years, we have, of course, learned a whole lot more about how landscapes and environments can change over time and how the presence of a landscape today is not necessarily indicative that it has always been so. One of the things that I want to explore in other lands is this idea of these ecosystems that are lost, these worlds that Earth has at one time supported, but no longer does. And so over the course of 16 chapters, and um, I visit 16 sites which are extraordinary either in what ecological lessons they can teach us or in environments that um, no longer exist or creatures that are very bizarre by the standards of our own sort of arbitrary present day. At the time they existed, of course, all of these landscapes were full, fully fledged, vibrant, um, living places as much as any um, temperate rainforest or steppe grassland is today. And in fact, grassland is perhaps a, a, a good jumping off point. Grasses are, are ubiquitous today, right? They're the most, grasslands are the most common ecosystem on the planet um, in the present day. And yet um, they only really became a, uh, a, a landscape forming plant about 35 million years ago with the end of the Eocene period, the epoch, I should say. Um, grasses um, were not even present on Earth um, until approximately 100 million years ago um, in the Cretaceous period, which means that dinosaurs like Stegosaurus, like Diplodocus that lived in the Jurassic would never have encountered a grass at all, and indeed would never have encountered a flower. Flowering plants, although the most common type of plant that exists today, arrived um, on Earth about 125 million years ago, at the beginning of the Cretaceous period, 
diversifying and in what is sort of termed as the Cretaceous angiosperm revolution at about the same time as insects which pollinate them um, also became extremely diverse. But these grasslands themselves only became uh, widespread at a point of dramatic climate change, right? Um, for most of the Cretaceous, for most of the Paleocene, most of the Eocene, um, the earth was a very warm place. There was uh, no um, there was no ice permanently at the poles um, in what is termed a greenhouse world. Um, in place in Antarctica, Antarctica was covered by lush temperate rainforest, very similar to that which you can find today in Rannoch and indeed in places like Chile and in um, British Columbia in Canada. Um, and in parts of uh, Western Europe, like um, like Ireland, and as I say, like in the Western Isles of Scotland, um, this rainforest um, supported uh, a, a, an environment which is um, preserved really only in fragments um, on the southern fringes of the other southern continents in, in in the Valdivian rainforest of Chile and in parts of New Zealand and so on, which are dominated by Araucarian monkey puzzles, um, by um, uh, and, and, and by um, Nothophagus, which is uh, the southern beech, a relative of our beech trees. Um, uh, these, this greenhouse world changed, and it changed as a result of, of um, a combination of factors. One was that India was rapidly piling into Asia at that time, raising the Himalayas and exposing a lot of silicate rock. When you expose silicate rock, carbon dioxide gets um, absorbed and that removes it from the atmosphere, which causes temperatures to generally drop. And the uh, second factor is that South America and Antarctica became separated from one another. And when that happened, uh, a, an oceanic current was able to be opened up, which still to this day circles Antarctica continually without colliding into any other landmass. And because it has this continual circling, cycling nature, the atmosphere above it is also sort of locked off from the rest of the atmosphere. Um, Antarctica became this um, isolated system that was no longer being warmed by warm water currents and warm air currents from the north, from the equator. And so Atl Antarctica began to glaciate. It began, the ice sheets spread out from the high Antarctic mountains and eventually pushed out any trace of um, complex ecosystems and um, large plants, large animals um, from that continent until the only permanent inhabitants of that continent today are a few small plants, a little moss, a little liverwort, and, uh, and the emperor penguin, which doggedly holds on as the last survivor of that, um, of that sort of great tra uh, transantarctic uh, rainforest. And when the earth cooled, the opportunity came for grass. Um, grass is a plant which is very well adapted to that sort of middle of the road um, climate where it's a little bit too dry to support a fully fledged forest, um, but not so dry that you can't have extremely productive landscapes. Um, it's uh, they like middling temperatures. They don't like it to be too hot, too cold. And so grasslands are very, very well adapted to the ice house world, which has only existed for about 35 million years. Um, and so we really should look at the world around us, not as you know something that is necessary and intrinsic to the functioning of life, but something which is purely necessary and intrinsic to the functioning of life right now. And as a species which has evolved in the last couple of million years and which exists right now, we should be very careful to make sure that we do maintain the, the um, global environments in which we have evolved and in which we continue to live. The, when I talk about, you know, when, when people talk about life persisting after any mass extinction, of which there have been several in the past, and of course life has persisted, it is why we're here, we should not never take that as a, um, uh, as a reason for inaction, a reason for um, sitting back and thinking, well, it'll all be all right in the end. After a mass extinction, everything always changes. The world always reasserts itself in a new and unusual way that has never been seen before, many of which are marvelous 
and wonderful. Um, but we should also uh, remember that the particular ways of life can be extremely fragile. The grassland that existed 20,000 years ago when Rannoch was covered with in kilometers of ice, um, uh, one of those grasslands was called the Mammoth Steppe. It stretched all the way from the Iberian Peninsula in the west through Europe, through what is now Russia, um, across a dry land, um, uh, what is now the bottom of the Bering Straits, um, into Alaska, into Canada, as the largest continuous ecosystem that has ever existed on this planet. Within a few thousand years, it had disappeared more or less entirely, restricted now only to a few patches of analogous environments in what is now Mongolia. That change was brought about by the um, a runaway transformation uh, as moisture broke in to the um, this enclosed courtyard-like space um, hidden by the Himalayas and other mountain ranges, hidden by ice sheets, um, as moisture managed to find a way in and turn that grassland into peat irreversibly, um, the biggest environment in the world vanished over the course of a of, of very short time. We are at a point now when um, the changes that we are affecting to the, the the climate, to the atmosphere, have the potential to um, have a similar runaway effect. But we are at that point of choosing that future. We have uh, uh, the we have the technology, we have the political means, and we have the um, the examples to follow, like the Montreal Protocol, for example, um, to uh, to avert this catastrophe and all it takes is coming together. I want to end with another um, sort of old old climatologist, not quite as old as Shen Kuo. Um, this time in 1856, a paper by an American woman called um, Eunice Newton Foote um, was published. She was interested in um, how it could be that the coal swamps that are seen in the fossil record um, are found in places which today could not support such tropical swamps. This is before an understanding, of course, of plate tectonics. Um, but one of her uh, hypotheses are the, these coal swamps, which are you know, found in everywhere from Illinois to the Midlands of the UK to Westphalia in Germany, um, were in a world where carbon dioxide was higher. That is how coal could be laid down in the first place. And she wondered what effect that would have on the climate what effect that would have on the environmental temperature. So she filled glass cylinders with air, she filled them with hydrogen, she filled them with carbon dioxide, and she um, exposed them to sunlight and she and um, put them in direct sun, she put them in the shade. But the results that she found were unmistakable. Carbon dioxide filled cylinders in the sun quickly reached the temperature of 52 degrees Celsius, 125 Fahrenheit, as she reported it, compared with only 104 degree, uh, Fahrenheit, 40 degrees Celsius in the cylinder of air. And she reported that um, with respect to carbon dioxide, an atmosphere of that gas would give to our Earth a high temperature. And as if some suppose at one period of its history, the air had mixed with it a larger proportion than at present, an increased temperature from its own action, as well as from increased weight, must have necessarily resulted. Now, I mention this story because this is in 1856. Three years later, in 1859, Three years after we had learned about the greenhouse properties of carbon dioxide, the first commercial oil well was sunk uh, in the USA, in, in, in Cherry Tree, Pennsylvania. At the time, it wasn't thought that we could release as enough carbon dioxide to cause that, um, uh, cause those changes to occur once again in our lifetimes or indeed you know, it, within a couple of centuries. But we have now demonstrably shown that that is not the case and we are changing that so it is um, up to us i think to um, reflect on this and to realize um, what changes we are in uh, putting on our planet and to think about the worlds of the past that are lost and to avoid ours becoming one of them thank you very much for listening